Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We have visitors. We're glad you're here and appreciate your presence today. Now, you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking, hoping during this hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to every one of you. You in the radio listening audience, if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour. I do believe we can be a blessing to them. I want you to take your Bible and turn to two places in the Word of God. First Chronicles chapter 28 and Psalms 144. You know, a lot of times you need to be careful what you say as a father or mother around your little ones. I'm reminded of this little boy, his grandmother, his mother's mother came one weekend to pay him a visit. And he is very ecstatic about it. And, and his grandmother said, oh, why are you so happy? He said, well, I'm going to see it. He said, I didn't believe it. I'm going to see it. She said, see what? He said, my daddy said, if you come this weekend, he's going to climb this wall backwards. Now, I've never seen him do it before, so I'm looking forward to it. So you have to be careful what you say around the little ones, but we appreciate them. I'm going to bring a message today on this line of thought. Know thou the God of thy father. Fathers are mentioned 1,300 times in the Bible. Mothers are mentioned 363 times in the Bible. That shows you there the great responsibility that rests upon the fathers. We thank God for our precious mothers, but the fathers have a great responsibility toward their God, their home, and their country, and their church. I want us to see that today from the message. First Chronicles uh, chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Now David here is talking to his son Solomon. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Notice that phrase, know thou the God of thy father. And serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be fond of thee, found of thee, rather. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord has chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary to be strong and do it. Now turn, when you please, to Psalms 144. The 144th Psalm. Psalms 144, verses 11 through 15. And David is still talking here. David, the man of God, this is his psalm. Psalm 144, verses 11 through 15. Page 669 in the original Schofield Bible. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones, polished after the similitude of a palace. That our garters may be full, according all manner of store, affording all manner of store. That our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. That our oxen may be strong to labor. That there be no breaking in nor going out. And there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people that is such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Remember, know thou the God of thy father. That's what I'm speaking on this morning. Know thou the God of our father. We need some great men and fathers today. If we had more real fathers, we'd have less long-haired beaknets and atheists roaming the streets today like wild animals. I believe many times the parents are largely responsible for the way their children act out on the streets and out in public in various places and the way they dress. Several things I want us to notice what David said here to his son Solomon. David was a great father. He was not a perfect man, but was a man made after God's own heart. David made many mistakes in his ministry. He paid for them dearly, but David was God's man after God's own heart, God's king. And Solomon, of course, was a great king, very wealthy king, a talented king, and God blessed and used him. God used these men 40 years each in their ministry. David was concerned about his son knowing God. 
Verse 9. And now Solomon my son. Know thou the God of thy father. David is deeply concerned. About Solomon knowing the God of their father. God in heaven. That's what he's talking about. The God of, of, of David. He wanted to be sure his son knew that God. Now every father today has a solemn responsibility. He should be concerned about his children knowing God. That should be the main concern about any father as to whether or not his children know God. If they don't know God and die and go to hell, then he's going to regret that forever. The responsibility rests mainly upon wherever he serves, but you need to be more concerned about his spiritual welfare. Now a lot of people today, they're very anxious. They sacrifice money and means and effort. They send their children through school, and I'm not negating that. Good education is fine if it's the right kind. But they neglect the spiritual side, the spiritual phase of their children, and that's detrimental. You need to realize that. Secondly, he needs to know God experimentally, not just talk about God and and give a little mental assent to the things of God, but know God experimentally. Every child, when he reaches the age of accountability, should know God by an experience. Have an experience with God. Be saved. Be born again, as the Bible tells us. In verse 9, it said, Know thou the God of thy father? Do you know God? It's well and good whenever fathers set their children down and talk to them personally about their spiritual welfare and be sure that they have been saved. But no father can train his child in this way unless he knows God himself. It's foolish for you to think you can train your child spiritually when you are dead spiritually. Every man without God is dead spiritually. There's no way, no way under heaven you can train your child from a spiritual viewpoint if you don't know God because you're dead and you can't do it. Number three, he wanted him to serve God with a perfect heart, also in verse 9, and serve him with a perfect heart. God looketh on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. God must first have man's heart if he gets the man. If God doesn't have the heart, God will not get the man. But if God gets the heart first, then God can get the man. So it's our responsibility to see that our children know God, that God have their hearts, that they've been truly saved. Number four, he wanted him to serve God with a willing mind in verse 9. And he said, with a willing mind. Now you can train your children, talk to your children, and let them realize what's important in life and cause them to want to serve God with a willing mind. I don't like to see parents have to force their children to serve God. Now while they're little, of course, you tell them what to do and bring them to church and so forth. But as they grow up, become of age, they ought to be willing to serve God willingly from their hearts and not forced by their parents. And I believe when a child is brought up in the house of God and know God, he'll have that desire to serve God willingly. God doesn't want your service against his will. He money against your will. Now, if you don't want to give of your tithes and give of your offerings, God doesn't want it. Just keep it. You've got to be willing to do it and want to do it from your heart then God accepts that and God keeps a record of that and God uses that and God rewards you for that and God blesses you in this life for it. But if you don't want it, if it's against your will, just keep it because you're going to be the loser anyway and it might come in handy somewhere down the road because you cannot win and, and rob God with your tithes and offerings in the long run. Number five, if a father seeks God, he will be found of him. Also in verse nine, I'm giving you these scriptures out of the first scripture I read in 1 Chronicles 28, verses 9 and 10. It says here, If a father seeks God, he'll be found of him. In verse 9, If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. It is sad when a father needs God and doesn't have him. A, a father needs God every day. And if you don't have God and something happens to your family, and you get the news your child has been in an automobile wreck or seriously ill or something's gone wrong, and you don't have God, you're in bad shape. You're in sad shape. If that child knows daddy knows God, and daddy be praying for him, that goes a long way with that child. But if that child knows dad doesn't know God, then how can he turn to God? Some time ago, there's a young man that was shot at a place where they drank and gambled and so forth. 
And the last words he said was, Call my daddy, I'm dying. Listen to me, dear soul. Do you know God if something happens to your children? Could you say, Call my daddy, I'm dying. I want to pray for me. Beloved, you need to realize that it's important that you know God, that you be able to pray for your child. Number six, if he forsakes God, God will cast him off, verse 9. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now you forsake God in his house now. There may be a day when he'll forsake you. Now in order to have God now and out in the future, know him now. There may come a time if you forsake God, you're going to be forsaken by God. You will need him and you want him and then you can't find him. He's not there. You're not saved. You know not the Lord. So don't forsake God his house. Honor God, honor his house, honor him, and he'll honor you. He plainly said so. And in time of need, your God will be there. Great responsibility rests upon the dad, the man, the husband, the head of the house. God is holding him responsible on this earth. God is looking down the gun barrel at that man, not his wife. God's holding that man responsible for his house. God created man for that purpose. That's why man is mentioned so many times in the Bible. That's why a father's mentioned 1,300 times, while mother's mentioned only 363 times. That responsibility is resting upon that father. He's the leader, the spiritual leader in the home. He's the one to protect that home. He's the one to provide for that home. He's the one to lead that family in worship and carry them to the house of God. God is holding him responsible. So fathers have chosen God to build God's house and be strong and do it. Thought number seven. God chose men to do that. God chose fathers to do that. To build God's house and be strong in doing it. He said in verse 10, Take heed now, for the Lord has chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. David said, Solomon, I want to build a house for God and God wouldn't let me because I shed so much blood in cleaning out the land of Canaan. But God will let you build that house. He said, son, I want you to build that sanctuary. I want you to build the temple of God. And I want you to be strong as you do it. You know, it pleases fathers when they see their children become strong in the matter of serving God, in the matter of principles, and in living the right kind of life. It thrills a father to see his son do that. Now, God wants you to build the house of God. You men, you men, God is talking to from the word. Build the house of God. Women are wonderful. They're precious. We thank God for them. But you've got to have some men if you ever build the house of God. I mean men that know God. Men with a backbone. Men that's willing to serve God. Men that shoulder that responsibility. It's sad sometimes when you go to churches to run meetings. They're sitting out there about three men, about two dozen women. You can't build strong churches where there's no men. We need men in the house of God. Women are helpful, but we've got to have some men if we build a strong work for God. So I'm going to tell you how you can occupy and work and labor and please God as a man in building the house of God. Number one, find your place there as you should. You have a place in the house of God, Father. You have a place, Dad, in the house of God. Your place is there. And if you are not there, it's vacant. Your family knows it's empty. Your family knows you ought to be sitting right there and you're not there. You're letting God down. You're letting the church down. You're letting your wife down. You're letting your children down when you're not seated there in the house of God with your family. Secondly, uphold the house of God. If you have your name on the church roll and you love your church and you have a preacher that preaches the word of God and you're trying to get the job done for God, don't let anybody criticize your church. When they start criticizing your church, call their hands. Say, wait a minute here, buddy. I want to tell you something. I belong there, and that's my church. Now I'm part of that church. And just shut up your fly trap right now. I may have to shut it up for you. Don't let them criticize your church. If you sit around and let somebody criticize your church, if you're not careful on down the road, you'll sit around and let people criticize your wife and your young'uns. you got to have a backbone and stand up. For your church, your wife, and your children. If you don't do it, who's going to do it? Find your place in the house of God and uphold the house of God. Don't allow people to criticize your church. 
If the church is not good enough for you, go find you one that's good enough. Don't stay in the church that's not good enough for you. Get out and find one that you know is suitable and good enough for you to worship in. And when you find that church, drive up your stake and don't let anybody run your church or your pastor down. Call their hand and don't let them do it. They'll respect you for it. If you don't do it, they'll have no respect for you and they'll be criticizing you next. And then number two, uphold or uh, rather get your family into the house of God. That's the husband's responsibility. I take my head off, a would for head one. I take it off to any woman that will come to church and bring the children when a husband won't come. You have to appreciate women like that. They're doing what they can. And God will overlook that. And you women ought to do that. But that man is the one who should lead the way. He should say, listen, wife. Listen, children. You know where we go on Sunday? We go to God's house, not to the lake, not to the mountains, not to Grandma's reunion. We go to the house of God on the Lord's day. And go to the house of God. Your children will respect you for it. And appreciate that as they grow older. Get your family into the house of God. And then number four, support the house of God financially. Those children see what you do. There's a man one time grumbling about the, the, the sermons. He went home. And his little boy said, Daddy, said, I don't see why you grumble. said, what do you expect for a dime? He watched his daddy put a dime in the collection plate. Now your children know what you give. They know whether or not you support God's work financially. They know that. They know whether or not you drop in that tithe or offering and pull that pocketbook out and, and put money in that collection. They know, they see that. And that's setting a good example before them. I thank God for some of our young people. We have some here at Northside that have a job and they're tithing. That's one of the greatest things they could do. They'll have the blessings of God up on them. They're starting off right. They're not starting off as a God robber. They're starting off right in giving their tithes and serving God with their tithes and offerings. That they should do. And that's only right. And God will bless them. They're building something down the road for the future. And laying up treasures in heaven. So the Father has set a good example in tithing in the house of God and giving of His offerings. So support the work of God financially. Number five, train your children to love, honor, and respect the house of God. Now you parents do that. Train those children to love honor and respect the house of God. You can do it. A child that's, that doesn't honor his parents in his own home, a child that tears up all the furniture and breaks out the windows at home and throws food on the floor and, and acts like an animal, he'll do the same thing when he comes to the house of God if he's not checked. Now train him at home. And then when he comes to the house of God, he can be corrected and train him to honor, to love and respect the house of God. That's a place of worship. David prayed for his children. 9 Psalms 144 and verse 12. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. Here David is praying for his sons and he's praying for his daughters. He wants his sons to do well. He wants his daughters to do well. He prayed that they shall not be vain children in verse 11. That's the scripture I read in the Psalms there. He prayed that there not be vain children. Today you have vain children running all over the country. I saw yesterday my wife and I went to a place to purchase a little something. Two teenage girls about 17 and 18 years old came along. And one of them didn't have enough clothes on to make a pair of suspenders for an average size mosquito. And it was pitiful. It was sad. I thought to myself, a mother... I dad, I let their teenage daughter get out on the street and go into those stores dressed like that. There's something bad wrong somewhere. And don't be surprised if that child don't turn out to be a harlot or get on dope or whiskey. Beloved, you should teach your children how to dress out in public and expect them to do so. And the don't they go and become vain children, nobody having respect for them whatsoever. And he said in verse 11, speak, van speak in vanity. And then loud children. You know you have a lot of loud mouth children. All you hear is their mouth. They're running off at the mouth. Don't know what they're saying. They run off at the mouth before they get their brains in gear. And they talk all the time and say nothing. And that's why they come to church sometimes and talk and act like a, a, a little bunch of young'uns. And no respect for the preacher or the word of God being preached the house of God. You need to listen in the house of God. If you go into court and talk to one another and act in the church. 
When you get home to do that and hear the preacher when he's preaching the word of God. Loud mouth speaking. Talking while the preacher is trying to preach. Insincere children. Verse 11. At the right hand of, of falsehood. Insincere children. Not in earnest about what. Don't care what may happen. And then he had a goal for his children. Not only did he pray for them. But he had a goal for them that our sons may be like plants in verse 12. Now a plant is something that's rooted, cultivated, growing, and fruitful. You ought to be concerned about your children that they be like plants that are planted, cultivated, growing, and fruitful to the glory of God. Now you dads should check into that situation and see that they're planted well, that they are cultivated, and they're growing, and they're fruitful. And then he said that our daughters may be like a cornerstone. A cornerstone polished, polished like a cornerstone, beautiful like a palace, steady as a column of a palace, solid in character like a palace. That's what he said here in the scripture. It implies that good children promise success, that our garners may be full, and our herds may prosper, and our people happy. In verse 15. Now dads are largely responsible for that kind of family. Many times we try and try hard and seemingly fail, but God keeps the record. Old man Jacob lived a scheming life. Old man Jacob lived somewhat of a disgraceful life in many ways. Old man Jacob had 12 strong sons, not mentioned his daughter. And when the old man died, he was proud of those boys. Although the old man had lived a stormy life and sailed a stormy sea. And when the sun began to set, the waves calmed down, he sailed into the port smoothly. And around his bed stood twelve strong boys. And the old man said, boys, I want to talk to you. Those twelve strong boys came in and saw the old daddy lying on the bed, about ready to give up the ghost. And they respected that old man. Now he had lived a schemer's life. He had lied and he had done many things wrong. But his boys loved him and respected him. And he, they honored him on his last days up on his bed. And he loved those boys. And he said, boys, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you down near the end of life's journey. This is what will happen to you. And the old man told him what's going to happen to those 12 boys. And he threw his feet up in the bed and gave up the ghost. And they buried their father very proud of him. Perfect no. Many mistakes, yeah. Yes, many. Did things wrong? Sure. But they loved him. Whenever they came to bury him, they followed the old man to the grave and mourned many days for him. That was a little girl one time. She wanted to fix her daddy up something for a father's day. She's just a little thing. And, and for three weeks, she would hide herself alone in a room. And mother and dad did not intrude into her privacy. They wanted her to have a little privacy. They knew she was doing something good. And she worked on daddy's presence for three weeks getting him something ready for Father's Day. And when the time had run out, three weeks of work and the little thing had worked and toiled and planned and fixing Daddy a present. And she came running in on Father's Day and said, Daddy, I brought you a present for Father's Day. Daddy smiled, looked at her, said, Honey, I appreciate that. That's so sweet of you. But let me tell you something. He took her up in his lap. He said, Darling, I missed you for three long weeks. Said, honey, I appreciate your presence, but said, I want you to know, I appreciate the presence you gave me, but I want you to know, I'd rather have you, I'd rather have your presence, I'd rather have you sitting in my lap than to have the present that you labored three weeks on. I have missed you in the past three weeks, and your presence means so much to me. Now listen to me today. As you grow older, if your children are not their concern too much about you. They'll soon forget you. And you'll sit in your old days, lonely, hoping they'll come and pay you a visit. Yesterday, one of my grandsons came by, Randy Dover. And Randy spent about two or three hours my wife, with my wife and I there at the house. That meant a lot to me, that boy sitting there talking to his granddaddy. And he stayed at least three hours, if not longer. And that meant a lot. I'd rather had that from that boy than any kind of gift he could have gone and bought for me at any store in Athens, just to have him there. As you grow older, you appreciate the presence of your children more and more. But many times children neglect that. That's one of the great regrets of my life. One of the main regrets of my life. My daddy was a merchant. 
And he operated his business between here and Athens. I passed right by his business every day. I would see him there working. Many times I passed by and he'd be sitting on the porch after he'd leave his place of business. I'd go by and see him sitting there. But after my daddy went on to be with the Lord, one of the biggest griefs of my heart right now, and it grieves me, I didn't take out much time to go and be with my daddy. He was on the bed uh, of ever fixing for 12 months. I sat up with him at nights while he was sick, but I'm talking about when he was well. If I had my time to go over, I'd stop by and see him quite often. I'd go sit down on the porch and say, Daddy, I just want to sit here with you a while. I'd go by his place of business and say, Dad, I just want to drop around, see how you're feeling today. But I didn't do that. It grieves me. It grieves me. That's one of the greatest griefs of my life. But I didn't spend more time with my daddy in his last years on the earth. I guarantee you if I had my time to go over, I'd do it. I regret that to my dying day. When I get to heaven, I'm going to tell my daddy. I'm going to apologize to him. I'm going to say, Daddy, I saw you sitting on the porch. I saw you working at your business. I knew you were lonely. I saw your mother sitting there. I passed right by. I was young and going to town and going to the radio station and going to the hospital. And I just passed right on by, Dad. Throw my hand up at you. But I ought to just pull it in and sit down with you a while. And as you grow older, your children mean more and more to you as they just come and sit with you. Just to be with you a while. But strange as it is. The older you get, the less concerned they are about you. Somebody said when you're 20, you wonder what people think about you. When you get 40, you don't care what they think about you. When you get 60, you find out nobody thinks about you. And that's the way it is as you grow older. Let me insist upon you if you have a daddy, spend a little time with him. God's holding him responsible. He helped build this nation. He helped make the nation what it is. He helped make the family what it is. He worked and labored and cared for you and sent you to school and fed and clothed you. Many times he'd been neglected, ignored, but don't treat him that way. When you go and just sit with him a while, it'll mean something to him. And you'll be glad you did ere you come to the end of life's journey. Thank God for our dads. We couldn't make it without them. They're the ones that fight for the nation, protect the, the land from the enemy. Provide for the home, care for the family, and have that great responsibility. Mothers are precious, but thank God for dads. Let me give you this little poem as I close. It says, walk a little plainer, daddy. Walk a little plainer, daddy. Set a little boy so frail. I'm following in your footsteps. I don't want to fail. Sometimes your steps are very plain. Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little plainer, daddy, for you're leading me. I know that once you walk this way, many years ago and what you did along the way i really like to know for sometimes when i'm tempted i don't know what to do so walk a little plainer daddy i must follow you someday when i'm grown up you like i want to be then i will have a little boy who wants to follow me i'd want to lead him right and help him to be true so walk a little plainer daddy for we must follow you let stand our feet Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you use the message. Thank you for our precious fathers. Thank you for our forefathers that made this land what it is, that suffered and fought for this country, and our veterans that died for this land. God, we thank you for great fathers today. Bless everyone that's under the sound of my voice, whether it be here in the auditorium, out in the radio listening audience. I pray for them in Christ's name. Amen. Great is the responsibility of the dad. While she plays, Debbie plays for us. You want to get saved? Come back to God. Join the church. Or whatever. God leads you to come forward. You come right now while she plays for just a moment. Would you come? church or for any reason God is prompting you to move come forward